some way, Kath. Could have gone back to the house with the others. It's that invited us. Did he hell? An invitation is when you say, would you like to come back to the house for a wee whiskey? No, I suppose you can go back to the house if you want. And who were all those folk? rent mourners Never saw any of them come to visit Ferguson Hospital. Fair enough. And that minister! I thought he'd even met the guy. Talking about the tragic death of a young man of only 30 years. Fergus was 27! Get us up and sing Fergus's favourite hymn! Fergus was a rabid, card-carrying atheist. And that bit about the terrible illness that eventually killed him. Fergus didn't have cancer. He was a loony! A bam! Crazy metal! Out to lunch! Of another planet! You are pissed, my friend. That's right, it's coming for you. Aye. But I'm no an amateur. He was a genius. He could have done anything. Aye, so he could. you the same thing. The only guy who owns that record. Some collector. That's the original Brooke Benton version from 1968. 1969? How did you get in here? Nobody's supposed to be in here except authorised staff. I'm the electrician. Right, that's it. What? They don't go in like that. They do the night. What are you on? Is he? Is he? Daft bastard. What's the problem? What's the problem? Why is he no sedated? He's not a patient. Well, he should be. It doesn't matter to Fergus now. You're only storing up trouble for yourself. Aye. Well, it's easily done round here. Are you waiting on McTavish? Aye. I haven't seen him or in a couple of days. I hear you and Campbell are doing a pilot programme for Radio Scotland. Aye, we recorded Monday. It's exciting, though, eh? Try not to think about it. You don't need that, Eddie. I do. I'm going to a sales meeting. That stuff could take over, you know. Already has taken over. Without my wee friend here, I couldn't do it. First time I got pissed, I was 15. His teacher was going to make us memorise a poem and stand up and recite it in front of the class. But you didn't want to do it? No, I wanted to do it, but I knew the poem. But every time I tried to recite it, I'd forget bits. I was that terrified when the day finally came. My pal Colin and I had a couple of cans behind the bike shed to steady our nerves. And it changed everything. I had my nerve back. When I stood up in front of that class that afternoon, it was brilliant. You remember the poem? I didn't, of course not. No, I was that desperate. I started throwing in things like Mary had a little lamb, she also had a duck, she put them on the mantelpiece to see if they'd fall off. <laughs> Except the teacher never let me get the punchline. But the point, the point is that I didn't care. I could suddenly do anything, no matter how humiliating. No care. I was free. 
You'll not take your wee friend on Monday. Can I promise? But who knows? You might like my version of Mary Had a Little Laugh. And in closing, salesmen and sales ladies of the month, I want to bring your attention to this month's issue of The Glazier. It has some pretty disturbing news in it. It says here that Britain is presently experiencing a recession that householders and businesses are saying, no, I can't afford it. It's not the time to be fitting new windows to our homes and our shops and our offices. Well, do you know what I say to that? Lavery, work harder. Are you not already working harder? Remind me to sack you. Webster? Sell, sell, sell! No, we've done that. Maketeer? Balls and poppycock. Balls and poppycock. That's what I say. By God, and so does John Maketeer. And I'm proud to tell you that this afternoon he came to tell me that after walking in cold to the Lynx Business Systems building in Paisley, and after six grueling weeks of sales presentations, the company have asked him for a quotation for a full set of replacement windows. <laughs> is there, is there a recession on? No! Then get out there and sell Twinview! Yeah. You were late. If I'd been a customer, you'd have lost your sale. I'm sorry. Do you know what the essential paradox of being a salesman is? Do I have to guess? Take as much time as you need to close a sale, but don't be late for your next one. That's the essential paradox of being a salesman. A very wise man told me that, our national sales director. So remember it, and don't be late again. I don't mind him. He's been telling that story for eight years, and he still doesn't know what paradox means. So I hear you're doing the big district council tender. I've got a meeting on Tuesday. I was looking at the plans. This one should be worth at least 35k. Which is a fair old commission at 10%, eh, McKenna? I knew Griffin's going along to hold your hand. I thought we might need to negotiate a wee bit. So Griffin's made the contact at the council, got you the plans, and has gone along with you to negotiate the tender. What exactly are you going to be contributing to the deal? It's my tape measure. <laughs> Grandma, what? Jesus, what are you doing? Don't take God's name in vain, they punish you. But what are you doing? Tomorrow I make jumble sale. I raise much money to go to Lithuania. By selling Grandad's hat stand? He has no need of hats. He's dead. Why are you doing this? Because I need three thousand pounds and you don't give. You can't go to Lithuania in the dead of winter. You will freeze and you will starve. So it'll be like old times then. Will it be like old times? You'll die of hypothermia. That is not so bad. Being shot by the SS, that is bad. Is she really going to go? I want to die with my own people, Eddie. This is the only thing I ask. See what I can do. And that you come to Lithuania Club next week, too, baby. Okay. And that you bring beautiful wife with you so everybody tells me you're a lucky guy. Three things I ask. Grandma, I don't have a wife. You have till next Wednesday. I'm not going to find a wife by next Wednesday. Then bring your intended one. I don't have an intended one. You cannot do this for me. The last thing I ask of you before I die. Grandma, I don't have a wife and I don't have an intended one. What do you want me to do? Okay, bring girlfriend. Freeze! Don't look! What was the name of that record? Dream Lover. Which was in the British charts for? 19 weeks. In? 1959. See? I told you you could do it, did I not tell you? He is a genius, oh yes. You're still here. Oh aye, if they want to get rid of me, they'll have to catch me first. 
Rosalie's got us all organised for the pilot tomorrow, Eddie. It's going to be brilliant, and I have just come up with a perfect angle. Which is? We are going to be playing a number one hit for every year, from 1956 to 1970, aye? And I've got a list here of every number one hit in every one of those years, Eddie. So at the end of the hour, we invite our listeners to phone in and pit their wits against the master of hits, Dr Boogie! Who's Dr Boogie? You! That's the angle! So if they can ask a question about any of the hits we've played that you can't answer, they win a major prize. He's the genius. Campbell, this is a recording we're doing. The only folk are going to be listening are Paula and a couple of bored guys in their dinner break. Then we'll get them to phone in. Well, what's the major prize? We just kid on, there's a prize. So it can be anything we want. A trip to Graceland, buy time machine to meet Elvis. Lunch with the Archbishop of Canterbury. I don't have to conform to the vagaries of time and space. I'm a loony, for God's sake. Look, a full moon! Thought you wanted to keep quiet about that. They're not going to do to me what they did to Fergus, Eddie. Nobody's going to find me in a heap in the pavement. I'm going to flaunt it. I'm going to exploit it for all it's worth. Because we are loonies and we are proud! We are loonies and we are proud! We are money, and we are social worker, quick! Social worker! I shouldn't have tied in the box! Have you seen Rosalie? The social worker's here. She's never in tonight. She came in at half past seven, I saw her. Well, she's not here now. Are you calling me a liar? No, Stuart, I'm calling you stupid. Eddie, what are those boxes doing out? Uh, um, Campbell and I have been doing some organising. Well, could you put them back in the cupboard now? There could be a fire hazard. Um, uh, we're still working with them. Not said to put them back in the cupboard! It's all right, Stuart. We're still working with them. How low an IQ do you need for your job? Hey, like a no, match! No. No. All right, nobody's gonna break anyone else like a match. Rosalie, do you want to come out now before we end up with blood all over the floor? Rosalie, this is Linda Foster, the psychiatric social worker. She'd like to have a word. Worried about McTavish. Well, she's back. Aye. And she's not just she, she's them. Don't get too close. You could frighten them, she might run off, see. I found them yesterday. They've only opened their eyes for a wee bit yet. Imagine that, eh? Been born blind and know nothing but a warm belly and the smell of milk. She doesn't mind if I touch them. She knows they're safe with me. Francine, could I ask you a favour? If you could get a pass, would you go to a club with me on Wednesday night? That's a favour? Is that not a date? Ah, no, if the club in question is uh, the Lithuanian Club of Scotland. Uh, well, it's not that bad. Um, you'd have to kid on you like Lithuanian music and that, and uh, folk talking about the old country, even though they were born in Motherwell. And um, you'd have to kid on you were uh, my girlfriend. What? My grandmother's going back to Lithuania at the end of the month, and she wants to be able to kid on to her friends that I'm not a complete loser. And I promised her. Ah, <laughs> oh, listen, that's just the most humiliating moment of my life. What? Asking me for a date? Asking her woman to kid on, she's my girlfriend. Then I'll kid on that well, you'd never guess it, isn't it true?
ready, boys? Eddie, you okay? Then let's do it. Four, three, two, one, go. This is Campbell Bean, and this is my alarm clock. It's also a clue. Dr. Boogie has just ten seconds to guess our first number one hit. The year is 1956. And you'll never believe what happened. <laughs> the section the both is. <laughs> section? You don't section a genius. You say, you did really well. You say, come see me on Thursday, Eddie. <laughs> because you know what I learned today? That the only difference between lunacy and genius is timing. Set off a fire extinguisher in a shrink's office and he'll have you locked up. Do it in front of an audience and it's high farce. It's time to start making lists full of the great things you're going to do, Rosalie. Instead of 12 bottles of disinfectant spray, put climb the highest mountain. Instead of large box of scourers, put cross the deepest ocean. Instead of one case of Dettol. What the hell are you planning here, Rosalie? It's just my discharge. When? Friday. They found me a place in the bed and breakfast. What about the supported accommodation? I'm still on the waiting list. There used to be this bed and breakfast in Bundorn, where Jim and me used to take Robbie every summer. It was all whitewashed with wee brass ornaments in the hallway. I don't suppose this place will be like that, though. You'll still be station manager. You know that. Aye. It's nice to belong somewhere. Oh, well, if it isn't ready, Eddie McKenna, star of Radio Lunyland. Oh, sorry, I forgot. You abandoned your glittering radio career to devote more time to your corporate family here at Twinview. <laughs> Is you away to your meeting with the council? Aye, as soon as Griffin gets. Griffin's always late, though. Why? Because you know what the essential paradox of a sales manager is, eh? Well, he doesn't have to be in time, but everybody else does. Wrong. The essential paradox of a sales manager is that he can be a certifiable lunatic, but we still have to call him sir. Now, he can take a guy they wouldn't let sell pencils for the blind and give him the plumbest sales lead of the year. <sighs> Guess a break, eh? Huh? Oh, any time. Just tell me which are him. <laughs> I'll go to the book. You shitting yourself in case Griffin doesn't turn up and you've got to take that meeting yourself? No. Stop pissing myself at your broken arm joke. Macketeer. <laughs> Macketeer! Open the door! <laughs> you stupid. Webster and Lavery are just listening for the new twin view Adam Radio Clyde. Good lads. Where's McKenna? No, sir. Should he be here? Oh, for Christ's sake! If you need some help with the tender, I'd be happy to come along. Right. Let's go. Well, I don't want to step in Eddie's toes or that, but if I go, who gets the commission? You do the tender, you get the commission.
Sorry I'm late. Uh, where's Mr. McKenna? Well, I'm afraid he's uh... right here. Ah, Mr. McKenna. Where's your car? I thought I'd uh, take the opportunity to use the excellent public transport system my regional council's responsible for. Uh, which doesn't always run on time, I'm afraid. Still, there's no excuse for lateness, McKenna. Right enough. But I want to pop in the planning department to check on the feasibility of using aluminium over UPVC on the access problem in the rear elevation. Very helpful, by the way. Excellent. Excellent. Hi. <laughs> well, thanks for your help, McAteer. Any time. There isn't an access problem in the rear elevation, is there? They seem to think there is. Oh, if you go back to the office, would you tell Jim we're out of block pay? There's a really good film we could catch for me. Yeah. I don't know. Somewhere. Bound to be. Are you sure you want to do this? Aye. Let's go. Francine, uh, this is Mrs. Prakarskas. Delighted to meet you. Uh, this is my um... girlfriend, Francine Boyle. Oh, oh, oh. Calm, calm, we sit. Is that your grandmother? Hi. Eddie! Oh, what's her name? Yeah, Francine. Francine! Oh, how happy I am to meet you again. Lovely to see you again, Mrs. Oh, you pronounce that so well. You speak so little way. No, I'm afraid not. Then we teach you. <laughs> you want the crazy one? Love us, Bacana. It was either that or a blow up doll. I was afraid the doll might get drunk and embarrass me. Love us, Bacaras, Manovartas, Ira. Oh, Eddie, she's wonderful and so pretty. <laughs> well, maybe she's okay. <laughs> Do you speak Lithuanian? I understand a bit. Manai kad jis jaija patinka. What are you talking about? The kus, is the kus Oh, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> How could you do this? I'm hey, going to find out. I'm in Lithuania then. Only tonight matters. What the fuck are getting married? <laughs> ah, Sukhtenis. We teach you Lithuania dance. <laughs> and no, I can't dance. Um, dance. Dance, dance, dance. Hands take your hands. Embarrass you, Embarrass me? They were congratulating me all night on finding such a lovely lassie for a wife. They wish us a long life and many babies, by the way. <laughs> anyway, thanks. For what? You know, kidding on. Thank you. That was my first date in seven years. I felt like Cinderella. I was even pretty. Fancying you are pretty. You're terrific eyes. I bet you wouldn't want to see my body. 
Uh, don't tempt me, Francine. No, it's so full of scars for me to slash myself. Then stop. I'd still have the scars. We've all got scars, Francine. Isn't McKenna dead on time to pick up his tender? Your punctuality is definitely improving. I'm not in the mood, Macketeer. So you were running it in the car or taking the opportunity to use the excellent public transport system our regional council is responsible for? Just I heard you had a puncture recently. I didn't have a puncture. My tyre was slashed, I had to buy a new one. Is that right? Well, it's getting to something when you can't park your car in front of your own place of work without some hooligan slashing the tyre, eh? Aye, and I wouldn't be surprised if next time I find my tires have been slashed, say, for instance, when I'm out delivering my tender, you find your bonnet's got paint stripper all over it. He's like the school bully, you know. Every time he comes in here, I expect him to take my dinner money off me. There's your tender, by the way. Thanks. You not going home? No. I was supposed to be going to a hen party the night. But McAteer wants this linked business system quotation by the Mora first thing. Well, just go. Look, first of all, you can't be expected to type this up. Fours look like sixes, the ones look like sevens. He's been working on this links quotation for weeks. He'd be absolutely furious with you. The only way to handle a bully is to stand up to him. Well, maybe I will go. That's the spirit. <laughs> If I don't stay out late and get in dead early the morning, I can still finish it in time, eh? Well, do I stand it up to you? That's keeping my job. Can you lock up for me? I still say his fours look like sixes. Well, it's the one for the money, two for the show. Campbell, I told you, I'm just going to go and find out what they thought of the pilot. But what if they make us an offer on the spot? Well, take it on the spot. On what terms? We've got to be clear on this. Aye, and I've written it all down for you, so I have. I've got to go. Number one, what exactly is on offer? Number two, will there be a trial period? I'm telling you, Campbell, there's not going to be an offer at this meeting. Number three, if so, for how long? And you have to wear that jacket. Number four, if there is a trial period, will the contract be non-exclusive during that time? It makes you look like a double blazing sales rep. Number five, what will the format of the show be? The screen. Yeah, Number six, yeah, look, there's nobody listening to me. I took the trouble to make this list, but I don't want you to go out of here without it, all right? I'll treasure it always. See you the night. <laughs> Eddie, 
You couldn't get us a couple of coffees, could you, Fiona? Sure. Coffee, huh? <laughs> Sorry? It's Campbell's theory. If they offer lunch, it's good news. Just coffee and it's bad. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm waiting for you to tell me that's a really stupid theory. I thought you'd be waiting to hear how much we liked your pilot. I am. Uh, I mean, uh, if you did. We played it again at our meeting with the head of entertainment yesterday. A couple of us felt it was a bit raw. But that's part of its charm, really. Ah, well, that's us. Raw charm. As I said, there isn't really anything coming up at the moment. But we did discuss the possibility of trying you out. Getting you to fill in for one of our regular DJs on holiday or at short notice. How would you feel about that? Uh, we'd, um, we'd feel pretty great about that. Yes. Although, there was some discussion at the meeting. This doesn't come from me, I hasten to add. But there were certain uh, reservations expressed about Campbell. About Campbell? Uh, I mean, I know he's uh, young and inexperienced, but the kid's a natural. <laughs> he's got a gift. <laughs> he's also got a mental health problem. I think... There was some concern that he might prove to be unreliable. The guy has practically created the hospital station single-handed. He just happens to be a manic depressive. He also happens to be young, hungry, and extremely talented. As I said, it's not my personal view, Eddie. But we did wonder, should a fill-in slot come up, if you would consider taking the show on your own. No. No, wouldn't he? That's very loyal of you. There's no loyalty. He's funnier than me. We'll be in touch. See, Eddie's here. Okay. I had to bring them in, Eddie. We'd have his dinner come back and as a throw us through the night. They weren't safe. You can't keep them here, Francine. Oh, indefinitely. I know. But I'll be getting out soon. I've been really well, eh? Aye. Aye, you have. And most of the patients are in on it. We've even soundproofed the locker. I just wouldn't want anything to happen to them. Nothing's going to happen to these wee ones, Eddie. They're safe. Francine, who's Uncle Frank? Name's there. Just somebody who used to hang about the house. My auntie Ruth died of cancer when I was too young to remember. After my died, Uncle Frank used to come round a lot to see my dad. He used to buy me loads of presents and that. On Saturdays, they'd play cars and get absolutely steaming. And Uncle Frank would stay over and sleep on the city. Except one night. He didn't sleep on the city. Stop with you. I was nine years old. Uncle Frank never slept on the city again. I used to hide sometimes. Our kid when I was asleep. I used to call out for my dad. 
I could hear him snoring. But he never came to help me. He was my dad and he should have kept me safe. But he never seemed to notice. Until you got pregnant. He never believed me when I told him. He called me a whore. I was 15. I messed myself when Jamie was born. The midwife said loads of women do that. Don't know. But see, when they gave me up my whole daddy, he was just that beautiful. And I, I knew I had to let him go. So that he could be safe. Check. Scourer. Check. Toilet bleach. Don't touch it, I'll get it. Check. Toothbrush, toothpaste, soap and hairbrush. Check, 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 check. Well, I suppose this is cheerio. Good luck, eh? Now, I want you to notice that I shook hands with you lot without the use of major tranquilizers, which just goes to show how well I am these days. Give you a left hand. Bob, we'll get you settled in. No, I don't want you to go in, Eddie. I want to talk to you now. Aye, sir. And do you know why I want to talk to you? Please don't make me. Guess. To sack me. Sack you? Why would I want to sack the best damn salesman the Strathclyde region of Twin View Winters has ever had? This man is the best damn salesman the Strathclyde region of Twin View Winters has ever had. Today, the District Council accepted our tender for £35,000 worth of windows now and £86,000 worth in the new year. Hmm? For he's a jolly good fellow. Sing! For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. And so say all of us. <laughs> speech, uh, speech. Make a speech, damn it. <laughs> um. Well, um, I, I just like to thank everybody who helped with the tender, especially Mr. Griffin. Uh, especially Mr. Griffin. Who did all the work? Checked and double checked everything. Well, you did exactly what, McKenna. Macketeer. If anyone needs to have their work checked and double checked, it's you. I've just had Link's business systems of Paisley on the phone to me. 
complaining very loudly about your quotation being 35% higher than your estimate. Ah, that's rubbish. I checked it myself. Good God, man, even the sums don't add up. These are no more figures. What were you on when you typed this up? Don't try and blame the lassie. I typed up exactly what you wrote. You've just become too damn cocky, McAteer. Someone's been tampering with my figures. So I told them we're going to send our top salesman to do a new quotation. And this time, by God, it'll tally with the estimate. What about it, McKenna? Eddie, Jesus, where have you been? Working, what's up? How did you not tell me about this? How did you not warn me? About what? Paula has been on the phone to me today. Oh. She seemed to think I knew all about it. Aye, I said, he told me all about your meeting, but it seems there was a few wee details you left out. I'm sorry, I... I know what you thought. You thought I'd just get agitated. I'm a manic depressive, so how not? That's not what I thought. But did you never stop to consider that one day a fishbone might get stuck in the throat of history and that we'd be standing here like we are now at the door of destiny and totally unprepared for it? What are you talking about? <sighs> the fishbone? The one that got stuck in David Thompson's throat? Who? Their Sunday afternoon DJ, he got a fishbone stuck in his throat last night, was rushed to casualty, and they've asked us to take his gold show today. No ready. Neither am I, but we're gonna have to go for it. No. No, I'm really no ready. Paula said we could use David's running order, but if we leave now, we can choose some stuff ourselves. I'm not ready. She said she'll be there to take us through everything, and you don't have to worry about here. Francine's gonna be taking our show straight off the air. I'm not ready, Campbell. <laughs> Eddie, you've been waiting for this moment most of your life. When exactly did you think you'd be ready? Now let's go! You're ready. Show and standing in for David Thompson is me, Campbell Bain, and Dr. Boogie, professor of pop, soul, and rock and roll. In today's competition, we invite you to pit your wits against the master of hits himself. If you can ask me any verifiable question on any of the titles that we play today that I can't answer, you win the grand prize. What is the grand prize, you ask? I'm holding in my hand a rare copy of Mandolins in the Moonlight by Perry Como from 1958. And unless you can stump Dr. Boogie, we're actually going to play it. How about it, gold diggers? Just phone 041 357 9719 to try and stop me. Don't play that song for me. <laughs> Cause it brings back memory of days that I was new. The days that No caller, I'm afraid Jim Morrison couldn't have written Bright Side of the Road. Because he was dead at the time, right, Dr. Boogie? Aye, a definite liability, but it did give Van Morrison the chance to write it instead. <laughs> Is that the BBC? Well, unless you can prove that Wilson Pickett had a boa constrictor called Hugo, I'm going to have to disqualify that. You know that you And it's become one of the most covered songs in rock and roll since Elvis's death. Don't play no more. Aye, 1977. It was in all the papers. 
And it's 3.47. Still 13 minutes left to try and stump Dr. Boogie, if you can. As Neil Armstrong said on that fateful day when he first put his foot on the moon. We are Lunnies and we are proud! 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 Try a little 